Hey y'all, welcome to Brianna Approved, a podcast for people who like a holistic approach to real science and clinical research on all things nutrition, botanicals, and balance. I'm your host, Brianna Diorio, clinical nutritionist, herbal practitioner, and recovering super spaz. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Brianna Approved Podcast. We are on episode seven, and today we are talking all things glymphatic system health. This is a really fun episode. The whole thing is basically going to be a nerd alert. We're going to dive deep about a lot of things. We're going to start out, of course, with our fun fact for the day and talking about why you actually feel half asleep if you sleep somewhere different. Then the main segment of the show is going to be Knowledge Bites, and we're going to really dive into not only what the glymphatic system is, but why it is important for, quote, detoxing your brain and how impaired glymphatic clearance can lead to things like dementia and why you need to get to sleep early, particularly for something called slow wave sleep. We will do our nerd alert on glial cells. And then we will do a health or hype on melatonin for sleep and if it's actually important. And now it's that time for your fun fact of the day while I sip cafe. (sighs) Did you know that one half of your brain will actually not sleep as deeply than the other when you are sleeping in a foreign environment? Now, you may have experienced this when you have been traveling or if you've been in a hotel room. And again, this is basically a threat detection mechanism that happens from the brain. I'm going to preface this entire episode by saying if you want any more research on all things brain health, particularly for sleep, you're going to want to get Matthew Walker's book or basically just research him. He's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley. And this is where I've learned a lot about this kind of information and even where I got this fun fact from. Now, when we go through different stages of sleep, we actually have something called REM sleep, which many of you know for, you know, our dreams, and then non-REM sleep, which is actually further broken down into four different stages of sleep. During non-REM stages, particularly three and four, these are very deep stages of sleep where the body actually kind of like recalibrates itself. And this is where we see a lot of the sleep benefits for things like cardiovascular health and metabolic health. And this is also the deep sleep that half of your brain will resist going into when you're sleeping in a foreign environment. So it basically stays in this lighter stage sleep, which from an evolutionary standpoint makes sense because if you're sleeping somewhere weird, your brain and body is kind of like, "Mm, I should probably like be on top of what's going on. So this is why you feel half asleep when you maybe even still got six or eight hours in a foreign place. For the next segment of the show, we are going to get into knowledge bites because we know that knowledge is your brain's favorite food. Okay, we are going to talk about glymphatic system, aka your brain's dedicated waste clearance system. It's basically the janitorial work that's happening in our human brain, especially when we are asleep. And it's this network of pathways that helps to clear out waste from the brain tissue when we're asleep, but it also helps to distribute non-waste things like glucose and lipids and amino acids and even neurotransmitters. So it helps to kind of clear all of that stuff out of the brain. It's our unique waste disposal system for the brain. And a little bit of history on this and how it came to be was actually from this researcher called Dr. Jeff Illiff. So he was a PhD and he studied at the University of Rochester Medical Center and did a lot of his research on mice first. So most of the research that we see on glymphatic system health does happen in mice, but we are starting to see some more research on people. And what I like to always tell people is that you don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand how powerful a good night's sleep is. You feel refreshed, you feel alert, clear-headed, right? We say things like, I woke up with a clear mind. And so we do know that sleep can affect not only our brain, but also, you know, our memory, our mood, and our cravings. 
And so what I like to tell people is, you know, imagine that a business was open 24-7 and it never had a cleanup crew come. Well, your brain is pretty much the same because it's dynamic and it's active all the time. It's a living organism and it's a living organ and it generates waste that needs to be cleared out. So the glymphatic system plays a role in taking out the proverbial neurological trash, quote, if you will, which again is where this is happening. And we know that we have this space between our brain cells, which can actually increase during sleep. So sleep can change the cellular structure of our brain, which is really, really cool. So the brain is able to flush out toxins that build up during our wakeful hours, much like when we're awake all day long and we're accumulating you know, trash from doing things, at the end of the day, we have to take that trash out. But what's really cool about our brain as opposed to a business is we don't have to hire a trash service to come and pick up this debris. We have this kind of all-in-one built-in trash service that comes and picks up the things that we no longer need. And when you are in deep sleep, we have something called our cerebral spinal fluid that is in the glymphatic system. And what that does is it basically, it it runs alongside the brain's blood vessels and it clears away this unwanted debris. So think about it as the windshield wiper fluid of your brain to help clear things out that we no longer need. Now, some of the cellular trash that we accumulate is more or less benign or maybe not necessarily as quote toxic that can lead to things like neurodegenerative diseases, much like, you know, if if we have trash, whether it's from a bag of potato chips or from a banana peel, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the trash that's sitting there eventually can lead to some damage, right? Or can lead to a foul smell in your kitchen. So we do want to still optimize the glymphatic system and make sure that it's picking up the trash that is maybe not as great or in particular things like beta amyloid plaque that has been linked to things like dementia and Alzheimer's, which we'll talk about throughout the episode. But again, we know that the glymphatic system is most active during sleep, and we've even seen research that it can be 10 times more active during sleepfulness than during wakefulness. What's interesting to note as well is that as we age, we can see disruption disruption in the glymphatic function. And this can be for several reasons. One of them can be we actually have a decrease in cerebral spinal fluid. So again, that windshield wiper fluid that helps to clear out debris. We also can have decreased flexibility and pulsing of the arteries. So that can be problematic. And then we also have changes in the glial cells, which we'll talk about in Nerd Alert, which basically play a role in the glymphatic vessels. So yes, brain aging is one of the factors that can lead to neurological disease, but decreased glymphatic function also is a factor in what's going on with neurological diseases. Now, as if people didn't already have a hard enough time sleeping or getting stressed that they aren't sleeping enough, you need a particular kind of sleep to optimize the glymphatic system. So yes, you need more sleep in general, but in particular, you need something called deep sleep, which we will talk about. And again, the glymphatic system is turned on during deep sleep and optimized in stage three and four of this non-REM sleep. So there was some research done in 2013 that showed that mice during sleep, their brain cells are reduced by about 60%, which creates more space in between these cells, giving that cerebral spinal fluid more room to flush out the debris. Now, as we've been saying the whole time, the bulk of this glymphatic clearance happens, of course, during sleep, but during deep sleep, when slow wave activity is most abundant. So this is why there's also a correlation between people as they get older, having less and less sleep and some more cognitive issues because as we get older, we actually have less and less of this slow wave sleep. Uh, This is because, again, the depletion of slow wave activity happens because we have more of the REM cycle sleep, which is where we're sleeping. And again, we don't undergo as much of that slow wave activity throughout the course of the night, even if you are still getting six or seven or eight hours of sleep. So sleep disturbances are more severe with age, 
which then comes more severe cognitive disturbances. When we're talking about slow wave sleep, we mean, again, that phase three of sleep, which is the deepest phase of non-rapid eye movement sleep. If you remember from the fun fact part of the show, we have non-REM sleep and we have REM sleep. So the slow wave sleep falls into the non-REM sleep, which is characterized by delta waves. So slow wave sleep is also very important for memory consolidation. This is why if we don't get enough sleep the next day, you might notice your memory is a little off. And this is why we also need to get to sleep earlier because longer periods of slow wave sleep occur in the first part of the night, primarily in the first two sleep cycles. So it's generally uh, about three hours. So this is why if you're at a party or you're at a bar that you don't want to be at anymore, you can just be like, listen, guys, I got to go. I have slow wave sleep that I need to get into. And that's a totally acceptable excuse. Now, most of this slow wave non-REM sleep, again, occurs in the first part of the night. And then REM sleep episodes only, you know, last about one to five minutes. These become longer throughout the night. This is why as we get closer and closer to waking up, we start to remember more of our dreams because we get into that lighter REM cycle sleep. So during a typical night, that sleep cycle, that third sleep cycle, occupies less time in the second cycle than the first and can disappear altogether in later cycles of sleep. So again, you know, we have more of that deep sleep earlier in the night. And as the night goes on, we have more of that REM sleep, which is a little bit lighter. And again, the deeper the sleep, the better. Journal Science and Advances indicates that slow and steady brain activity is associated with that deep non-REM sleep and optimal for the function of glymphatic system. So again, we want to get to bed. Of course, ideally, we want to try and get to bed earlier. We want to optimize that slow wave sleep, those delta brain waves. That's going to be really important for optimizing the glymphatic system and for things like optimizing our cognitive abilities because impaired glymphatic clearance can lead to dementia. So the quality of our sleep can predict the onset of things like Alzheimer's and dementia because sleep is when the brain clears out this neurotoxic waste that accumulates when we're awake all day, much like how we accumulate garbage all day from living our life. At the end of the day, you're going to want to take the trash out. So our brain does this right by our cerebral spinal fluid. And again, when we're talking about brain health, this cerebral spinal fluid is helping to get rid of things like beta amyloid plaque, which has been linked to dementia. So this amyloid beta, which is a protein that forms these plaques, is found in the brains of many Alzheimer's patients. And when we're talking about these proteins that are implicated or found in a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases, we know that yes, some of this is naturally produced and some of it is removed at basically the same amount, or I should say the same rate. So when this balance is thrown off, the beta amyloid, these proteins and these plaques can pile up over time and can spread and that's when it becomes problematic. So again, it's not necessarily the proteins themselves that are problematic. It's the way that we can actually clear them and the rate at which we can clear them. So these proteins can build up pretty much in two ways. They're either produced too fast or we remove them too slowly. And so research is now finding that people, some people have, you know, a genetic mutation that can cause this early onset Alzheimer's disease, which produces you know, more issues with how we can clear out the protein. But a large percent of people that are having early onset dementia and things like this, we're seeing that this late onset version of Alzheimer's, the rate of production of this plaque doesn't necessarily change, but the rate at which we can get rid of it does. So I want to repeat that because that's important. Again, it's it's not necessarily problematic that we you know, create this plaque and create this protein, it's how quickly we can get rid of it. So kind of back to the analogy of trash, if you keep taking out your trash all day long, right, it's not going to necessarily build up. But if you let it just sit in your kitchen and let it start to overflow, that's when it can become problematic. So the slowed clearance of the proteins can be a root cause of many of these neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, like dementia. 
And again, we do see that a lot of the issues that we have with sleep as we get older can basically cause a slower clearance in the brain, right? And so again, think about not taking out your trash as frequently. So there was some research that was done at NIH, so the National Institute of Health, and they found that losing just one night of sleep led to an increase in amyloid beta, right? So again, that protein that is found to impair how neurons actually function and can eventually lead to the development of Alzheimer's. And they used a PET scan. So they looked at 20 healthy participants after a full night's rest and after 31 hours of sleep deprivation. And this study found that the participants had about 5% more amyloid beta after the single night of sleeplessness. So basically, when we're not getting enough sleep, we're not taking the trash out, This can lead to accumulation of this beta protein, this beta amyloid plaque in the brain, which can eventually lead to Alzheimer's or onset. Or again, if we have a genetic predisposition to this, this might accelerate the process. We also know that the rest of your body is basically cleansed and detoxed by your lymphatic system. However, your lymphatic system does not have direct access to the brain because of something called our blood-brain barrier, which kind of acts like a bouncer outside of the club and will say like, no, you can't get in, right? Again, the brain is this kind of closed off system. It's a very exclusive VIP club. So that blood-brain barrier controls what can enter and what cannot. But what's interesting is that the glymphatic system runs parallel to the arteries and it actually connects to the lymphatic system of your body at the dura. So this is a thick membrane of connective tissue that covers the central nervous system. So that's kind of how they work closely together. For our next segment of the show, we are going to get into Nerd Alert, where we're going to talk about glial cells and astrocytes. Nerd Alert. Nerd Alert. So the G that is found in glymphatic is basically a hats off to the glial cells which is the brain cells that manage the entire glymphatic system. Now, the term glymphatic actually came about from a Danish neuroscientist who discovered the system, and the name is a reference to the glial cells, which again are really an important part of this whole entire waste clearance system that we have. And these glial cells, they protect and they nourish and they basically insulate the neurons. So think about it as kind of like saran wrap that goes around a sandwich, right? So they play a role in, you know, the glymphatic system. And in particular, when we're talking about glial cells, we're talking about astroglia or astrocytes, which are important because yes, these glial cells, they're actually these non-neural cells in the central nervous system. So again, found in our brain and our spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, the glial cells don't actually produce any electrical impulses. What they do is they help to maintain homeostasis and they provide support and protection for the neurons to be able to remove waste products or to remove dead neurons. Astrocytes in particular are a subtype of these glial cells that make up the majority of cells that are basically in the central nervous system. And they are this star-shaped cell that provide not only physical support for the neurons, but also nutritional These astrocytes clean up brain debris, debris, sorry, I couldn't help myself. They transport nutrients to neurons. They help to hold neurons in place. uh, And then they also like digest parts of these dead neurons. So really cool. They also play a role in clearing out excess neurotransmitters. So if we have, you know, excessive amounts of these neurotransmitters and they stabilize and regulate the blood brain barrier. Again, which is very tightly controlled, so what helps to get things in and out of the brain. So the astrocytes are kind of like the all-star of what's going on with the glymphatic system. For the last segment of the show, we are going to get into health or hype, and we're going to discuss if melatonin supplements are really great for sleep. So as you may or may not know, melatonin is actually a hormone that we make on our own. Some people will refer to it as the hormone of darkness or the sleep hormone, but what's interesting to remember about melatonin is that it influences our circadian rhythm, 
So it does play a role in sleep, but it's also important for our immune health. What I like to tell people is that as light fades, so do we, but as light rises, so do we. And this is kind of how melatonin works. Think about as it gets darker during the day, you kind of start to have lower levels of energy. And as the sun starts to rise, hopefully we are rising as well. So melatonin kind of has this inverse relationship where as it gets darker throughout the day, melatonin begins to rise. And as it gets brighter, melatonin starts to fall. And so I will preface the next portion of this by saying, again, I got a lot of this research from Matthew Walker. The book is called Why We Sleep. And so some of the analogies I'm going to get into are from him directly. So I definitely would suggest getting that book doing some research on him, listening to some of his his podcasts, really great information. But the way that he explains melatonin is that he says it's almost like a bullhorn that basically shouts out a message to the brain and the body saying it's dark. Like it's this biological command for the timing of sleep onset. So it basically tells your body like, listen up guys, we're getting ready to put our retainers in and go to sleep and put our, you know, blue blockers on and laugh at some memes. We'll talk about why we actually really shouldn't do that, but regardless. So basically, once sleep is underway, again, melatonin will slowly decrease in concentrations across the night and increase into the morning hours, right? So when the sun starts to rise, it sort of puts this brake pedal to the pineal gland, which kind of shuts off the release of melatonin. This is why if you have taken melatonin supplements in the past, you might realize that it kind of wears off and you might wake up during the middle of the night and you're not sleeping anymore. Again, because melatonin plays a role in regulating sleep cycles. So it helps us keep us awake at the right times, right? Which is like during the day and then helps us go to sleep when we should when it's dark outside. But when you produce melatonin is just as important, if not more so, than the total amount that you produce. So when people talk about circadian rhythm issues, a lot of the times, or for cortisol, for example, when people say things like, I have adrenal fatigue or cortisol you know, issues, you likely just have cortisol dysregulation relative to things like melatonin. So maybe you're producing cortisol at the wrong time. Maybe you're producing melatonin at the wrong time as well. So this is important as well because those are, you know, inverse hormones, right? So when, you know, melatonin is, you know, really high, cortisol can be low depending on, you know, what's going on with other health issues. But again, we want these levels to be higher at nighttime. So naturally highest levels are around, you know, 9 p.m. and lowest in the morning. So when the sun goes down and the day begins to get darker, the pineal gland is activated by something called our super schismatic nucleus. The name is not super important, but basically that is what helps to produce melatonin that is then later released into the blood. And so the super schismatic no, the super schismatic nucleus is essentially the body's clock that helps to regulate activities that can affect the entire body. So it can influence things like cortisol. It can influence how awake or tired we feel. And then even things like our core body temperature. So as these melatonin levels rise in the blood, again, we start to feel sleepy. We start to feel tired. And melatonin levels can stay elevated in the body for about 12 hours, which is also why sometimes when people take melatonin supplements, they can kind of get a sleep hangover, if you will. I'm one of those people I feel super groggy the next day and just like really tired and I kind of can't get it together. And so we should see melatonin levels naturally kind of drop off by about 9 a.m. And again, during the daytime, they should be pretty much not there. So if melatonin levels remain too high during the day, this can give us kind of that difficult start to the morning and can make us kind of feel sluggish and fatigued. And again, maybe you have a little bit of that melatonin hangover. So important to remember if you are taking melatonin supplementation. And again, melatonin, if you are taking it as a supplement, it can help to regulate the timing of when sleep occurs, but it's going to have very, very little influence on generating sleep itself. So it's not going to necessarily keep you asleep, which is again, sometimes why people will wake up if they take melatonin. So as far as health or hype goes, I think it's kind of hype. And there is a lot of research that talks about many of the benefits of melatonin for sleep in particular are due to the placebo effect, which we know how strong and powerful that is. But we also know that 
Sleep is multifactorial. Why we're not sleeping could be, again, because we're producing melatonin at the wrong time. We have disproportionate levels of melatonin to cortisol. We have we didn't expose our eyes to bright light during the day. I mean, the list goes on and on. I can probably do a whole episode on that. But there is a really nice analogy that Matthew Walker gives about sleep and melatonin and what that means for the body. So Matthew Walker says that you should think of sleep as kind of the Olympic 100-meter race. And so what melatonin does is it acts like the person who says, runners, take your mark, like the person who has the gun and and fires it off, right, and tells the race to start. Now, the guy who shoots off the race would be the melatonin in this analogy. It tells the race, which is sleep, to start, but it doesn't actually make people participate in the race. So again, in this analogy, the sprinters themselves, so the people who are running the race, are other brain regions and processes that help to generate sleep. So melatonin basically gets everybody together and generates these regions of the brain to start lining up for bedtime, right? So it's like, all right, runners, let's get it together. That's what happens when you take melatonin. But melatonin provides the instructions to start the event of sleep. So it says, all right, body, like we're ready. We're going to we're gonna try and go to sleep soon. But it doesn't actually participate in the sleep race itself. So this is why melatonin isn't always great or powerful as a sleep aid by itself. If we're talking about jet lag and resetting circadian rhythm, quote resetting, that's a different story. We're talking about sleep issues in particular right now. So again, a lot of the research that is on melatonin working for something like sleep can bl- can be placebo related. And a lot of the over-counter brands aren't always as efficacious as they say they are. Again, 83% of them actually had less melatonin than that was claimed on the bottle and 400% more than stated on the bottle. So the range of melatonin in an actual supplement you're buying can also be influenced. I really prefer nervines and sedatives, things that are, you know, maybe a little bit more of a long-term approach. So things like, you know, hops and kava and valerian, some of these other heavy hitters, and figuring out why you're not sleeping in the first place. So if you do want to take melatonin, I would highly suggest starting at a smaller dosage, so anywhere from, you know, 0.5 milligrams to 2 milligrams max. Um, There is really cool research actually on melatonin in endometriosis at very high levels, so like 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams every night. But again, we are talking about sleep in general. If you're looking for some extra credit, There are ways to optimize melatonin naturally. Again, because melatonin can be influenced by a lot of factors and what's going on with our sleep hygiene or, you know, what time we're going to sleep and waking up every day. Um, If you're, you know, a shift worker, if you are overstimulated with cortisol throughout the day, again, too much blue light at the wrong times, lack of natural light exposure. This is why it's so important to go out in the middle of the day and expose your eyes to bright light or do sun gazing in the morning. And then there is some research that there are certain foods that have very, very small amounts of melatonin. So things like bananas and pineapples, cucumbers, oranges. Again, uh, I would probably not be getting melatonin from your food source. But we can control our sleep hygiene, so how we sleep, right? So trying to sleep in complete darkness, trying to sort of power off, you know, with, you know, laptops and screens and TVs and all of that kind of, you know, two hours prior to bed, Um, and even making your room cooler, right, because that can play a role in how we're sleeping as well. And again, figuring out why you're not sleeping. Is your mind not shutting off? Are you kind of wired but tired? Have you, you know, maybe worked out too late in the day? Did you eat something that's off? So you have to figure all of that out. Now, hopefully this episode made you all sleepy and made you want to go to sleep. Maybe you're making some sleepy time tea. Maybe you are going to listen to this and it's going to put you to sleep because it was so boring. Either way, I hope you guys all now have an excuse to leave parties and gatherings early optimize your sleep, be a social recluse, and I'll see y'all next week. Ciao.